Well, hi, everybody. It's another Conversations with, and today I'm delighted to have with me uh, Reverend uh, Steve Nordby. And uh, Reverend uh, Steve is uh, the pastor of the Chowton Baptist Church, and uh, we're delighted to have him. I met him in a most unusual way. Uh, it, was, it was the uh, uh, Halloween weekend, and uh, uh, Jen and I had dressed up as scarecrows and came to the trunk and treat or whatever they called it here at the, uh, at, the, at the cultural center and driving back I noticed a group of people on the town common and they were having a pumpkin festival of some sort. Mm -hmm. We said wouldn't it be fun to stop and say hi and that's how we met mm -hmm. and, uh, and I certainly invited Steve to come and join us and, uh, and chat about uh, the Charlton Baptist yeah. Church. Appreciate your Invitation. I know when we communicate afterwards, you said, "Well, maybe we can meet for coffee, duck, and donuts." I said, yeah. "That's fine," but you have to identify yourself because I just know you and your scarecrow yeah, outfit, yeah, and there's yeah. no way that I'm going to walk in there Say, and be able to spot oh, there you. He is, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad we're able to meet yeah. here, and so I didn't have to yeah. worry no, about but, that. Well, that's that's great, and uh, and you know, one of the things that uh, that that's going on is we're in a crazy, crazy world today, and 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 we hear so much about the hatred that's in the world and the, and the the violence that's in the world, and yet um, the serenity of it all is there's a lot of love, and, and in your parish, in your little church, and, and, and the various churches uh, preach love and, and God and mercy, and, uh, and yet we, we have so much violence going on, and, and it, it's, it's kind of concerning, and, and uh, you say to yourself, wow, how do we, how do we get this, how do we get people back? Yeah. How do we get them focused on the good part of it all? Mm -hmm. That is a tough question. It's easy to, to look on the sort of the macro uh, reality of evil, but and I, what can lost in it is there's that evil in each side of us. I remember oh, yeah. a story about a young man who, who saw some atrocities as a soldier in World War II. As he saw that, his biggest fear was, I could see that in me as well. So it wasn't just them being bad and me being good. As, as, as I see the bad there, I see it manifested in my own life. And maybe that's the first step, is just to recognize, even with all the worldwide manifestations of, of evil and violence and greed and pride, is to be honest enough to say, maybe I don't exhibit those to the same degree or excesses. Those same dynamics are in me as well. And so maybe the place to start is just to look at my own life and, uh, and aware it is. And, yeah. and that was one of the questions that really led me on my spiritual journey, was, yeah. was asking that sort of question. I remember as a senior in high school uh, at a party, and a guy threw up in the sink for drinking too much. Yeah. And even as a high school, I thought, that's kind of pathetic. But then as I thought about it, I said, I'm really not that different than him. I've never gotten sick like that. But the same life of eat, drink, and be merry, oh, uh, yeah. that's so typical for high school as well as many people, that's really me as well. And so that was the issue yeah. that started me and what I sort of mark as the beginning of my spiritual journey was to say, let me look at myself and what's my purpose of life? What's my direction? And so I think that's beneficial for uh, everybody to do that. Well, you know, uh, you, you mentioned that. And I, I, mean, I was telling someone the other day, uh, I graduated from high school uh, in, I, in Massachusetts in, in 1953, and it was a different world. Mm -hmm. It was a completely different world. Um, I've often said I got three grandkids. I wouldn't want to be a little kid today for loving the money. Mm -hmm. I mean, the temptations and the challenges that they face at a young age yeah. with, with drugs and, 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 and all the crazy. And you know, the sad part is the impact that television has made. I watched the Patriots last week, and the networks run these promos during the game. Mm -hmm. And the promo was some guy ripping off a woman's dress, you know, <laughs> tonight, watch what happens. Yeah. And then there's a car blowing up and there's a cop shooting somebody or somebody shooting a cop tonight on CBS, watch. And the kids are watching this stuff. Mm -hmm. And then we wonder why the kids are crazy, yeah. you know, and, 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 and it's, it's, they're almost exploited by it. Mm -hmm. You know, where, when we grew up, I mean, we didn't have TV until the early 60s. So we grew up with radio. Mm -hmm. you know? We had Jack Armstrong, the All-American Boy, and the Lone sure. Ranger rides again. Yeah. You know, uh -huh. and and so, you know, to your point, uh, you know, we, we each have to look at ourselves mm -hmm. and say, what contribution do I make? Mm -hmm. You know, am I kind? Am I generous? Do I care? Uh, do I reach out? I, I always tell the story. I was 12. 
I had a chance to speak at the United Way one year, and I told this story. And people afterwards come up to me. I was 12, and my mother used to do the work to pay the bills at home. And I came bouncing home from school one day, and my mom was sitting at the table, and she was writing out some bills and paying the bills. And I noticed that she took a dollar bill and put it in an envelope. Well, a dollar bill? Mm -hmm. That would buy me 20 Coca-Colas back in those days. <laughs> I could go to the movies 10 times. You know, I'm saying, whoa, a dollar, Mom. What's that for? And she showed me the envelope. And in the upper corner was a little boy, a character of a little boy, holding another little boy on his shoulder. And the little boy on the shoulder had a crutch. And the tagline was, he ain't heavy, Father. Mm -hmm. He's my brother. Mm -hmm. And it was Father Flanagan's Boys Town. Right. And my mother then explained to me that every month she sent a dollar to this Father Flanagan's Boys Town and that we had a brother that we didn't even know. And that each, each month Father Flanagan would take that dollar and that would support a little boy at his school who didn't have a mom and dad like we had who didn't have his own bedroom like you have, mm -hmm. who didn't have a nice warm bed like you have, mm -hmm. who didn't get supper every night like you do. And I often tell that story, that we really are our brother's keeper. And yet sometimes as we, we go through today's society, it gets lost. But to your point, you know, uh, when all else fails, to thine own self be true, my old buddy Bill Shakespeare was fond of saying. Yeah. And, and I think the most difficult Time, thing for us to do sometimes is to thine own self be true. Yeah, you know? though I also recognize sometimes the truest part of me is something that is not necessarily uh, the most desirable. Again, as you look at your own, oh. own life and, and you see the pettiness and I see the pride and I see all those other things and so um, you know, I always think about the parable that Jesus told about the um, Pharisee who came to worship and he gets up there and he stands up and he's prominent and he sort of congratulates himself to God how good he is. I'm not like that sinner off in the corner. Right. There's this little sinner off in the corner that is just so humiliated by his own brokenness he can't even look up to pray and just, just begs for God's mercy. And Jesus asks the question, which one went when justified? Yeah. It's, it's not the one that could uh, parade all yeah. of his uh, religious accomplishment. It was that, it was that broken man who just recognized his own brokenness and needed to throw himself on the yeah. mercy of God, which, of course, the, yeah. the gospel tells us that, that mercy and grace is, is mediated through yeah. his son and his death. Well, you know, a lot of it is, too. I, I, I'm always reminded of, of the, the, the saying, whatever you do to the least of my brethren, mm -hmm. so you do unto me. And how many times do we think of that? Mm -hmm. You know, when we, when we gossip about somebody or we blast somebody or we get mad at somebody mm -hmm. or we make an obscene gesture because he cut me off you know or he beat me at the red light or whatever it is and 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 to what we said mm -hmm. how many times am i i'm guilty sure. you know yeah. man i just got aggravated over something that was so unimportant so what if he cut me off you know so what if he didn't use his blinker but boy that upset me yeah you know yeah well james the new testament writer talked about the power of the tongue he said you in one one hand you praise god on the other hand, you curse people who are made in God's image. And mm -hmm. the implication is to curse those made in God's image, you, in a sense, are cursing God. Oh. And so be very careful on how yeah. you use your tongue, yeah. uh, not just in when you pray piously towards God, oh. but how do you just speak about and to uh, one another? Well, you know, it's funny you mentioned that. I was at one of the donut places, Dunkin' Donuts, this morning, <laughs> and a woman was there, and something she spilled something. Oh, why did God do this? And I started to laugh. Oh, and I looked at her and I said, poor God. And she looked at me and I said, poor God. He gets blamed for more things he had nothing to do with. <laughs> and he gets a ton of credit for things he didn't even know happened. That's true. That's I said, true. you bought the lottery ticket. If you got a hundred bucks, God had nothing to do with that. You know? <laughs> that's that's and, probably true. And by the way, you're the one who knocked the coffee off. And I, I was telling someone one day and they, and they were saying, well, wait a minute, though. I said, hold on. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you saw him jump down off that cross and say, come on, Steve, let me show you how to do that. <laughs> you know? And if it looks at me. But, but it's, I mean, I remember John Kennedy's inaugural address, the shortest in history of all the presidents, and yet the most quoted. Well, the funny part of that is the thing they quote most is ask not what you. However, the last two lines of his inaugural address 
were the most powerful two lines of the whole address, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And this is what he said, how he ended his inaugural address. We ask God's blessings and his guidance on this endeavor, knowing, however, that here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. Mm -hmm. And so true in what we've just talked about, uh, yeah. Reverend Steve, that, that you know, we are the people. If, if we go out and blast somebody or criticize somebody, what, what are we really doing? Mm -hmm. Are we showing sure. love? Are we showing mercy? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and so it, it's, uh, it, it's an interesting, interesting situation how sometimes we ourselves don't look at ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I mean, I remember when the ki I had five kids when they were growing up, I used to have a sign in the refrigerator. Ultimately, we are responsible for ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, and, uh, and the kids would all, you know, when they, they'd come in and I'd say, but you did it. <laughs> you know, you, you sure. sit down, let's chat about it. Let's see what we can... You know, and mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it's how do you how do you get them to understand that you know it's so easy to blame somebody else, you know, when unfortunately sometimes it's our it's our own failings. Sure, sure. You know, yeah. it really is. Mm -hmm. So now, how long have you been in Charleston? Uh, my wife and I moved here in the fall of 1988, so it'll be our 30th 30th anniversary next year. Oh wow! Yeah, that's great. Yeah, quite. Well, a you know, we we're, we're unique. We we're, we're very unique in Charleston. And, and I mean that by saying we have Reverend Jim Chase, who's been here for 30-odd years. Been here a year or two earlier than me. Yeah, and Father Bob Gratterati at St. Joseph's been yeah. here for another 26 or 27 yeah, he's years. Been here. You know, and then yourself, now 30 yeah. years. And that's been a lot of fun, because I think there's a real good relationship. We have um, lunches every month, the Charles yeah. pastors get together. Of course, Jim, Bob, and I have been doing yeah. it for over yeah. two, two decades now. And there really is a, a mutual support and respect. There's not a sense of competition no. uh, that we have. We've done a few cooperative things yeah. together over the years, um, but a lot of it is just a monthly time of just uh, catching up and just kind of keeping yeah. those lines of communications. And I think that's somewhat kind of rare. I don't know if that happens in a lot of communities and a lot of factors go into the fact that we're able to do it. Yeah. One is our longevity yeah. and one is just kind of who we are as individuals, individuals. that uh, really, really seems yeah. to uh, sort of encourage us and, and maintain this. And, and, and it's and been you know, a lot of fun, and I've enjoyed it. There's a, there's a tremendous amount of, of respect. I mean, I happen to, 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 to be friendly with Father Bob, and, and he's the one who introduced <coughs> me to, to, to Reverend Chase. And, and I know that, that Reverend Chase and him exchanged pulpits in, mm -hmm. in February. Um, they have, they, during ecumenical month or whatever it is, they, they do stuff together. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I know that, as you mentioned, you, you folks get together, you know, on a regular basis mm -hmm. and, and sit and chat and, uh, and exchange ideas and thoughts and so forth. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, I, and, I, and, and I have to be real honest, it is unique. Uh, and, and I think it's so important um, because in many communities, it doesn't happen that mm -hmm. way. Uh, you know, uh, they, they, we, they grow up differently and, mm -hmm. and, and there's a separation where, where um, you know, the, the, the amazing thing is we all, all of us, whatever name you put on yourself, Christian, Baptist, Methodist, Jew, we all worship the same guy. We just have a different road to get there. And, and when you think about that, you know, how far are we really apart, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, yeah, and we'll, we'll occasionally talk about our, our, our doctrinal differences. And, yeah. And, I, and there are still some, I would say there are some significant doctrinal differences between Catholics and Protestants, and I don't think we do anybody any service to just sort of uh, ignore those or just no. sort of uh, pave over those. Uh, but to recognize these are issues that will continue, should be continued in discussion. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and I think uh, can be really you know, healthy in the long run. And I've, I've sat down once with Father Bob for a couple hours just to have some questions. Yeah. And it was, it was a great time just seeing, you know, getting a better understanding of the Catholic view of certain questions I had and areas where I'd find disagreement and areas yeah. where I'd find agreement in, but it was just a very uh, collegial conversation yeah. and, and no sense of defensiveness. No. And, and I think well, that needs to be that, that mutual respect, even if there might be some significant oh, yeah. doctrinal differences we well, might have. Well, even, even I think, and I, I only can speak for myself, in, in my life, I mean, 
I was three weeks old, and I was taken into a church, and that my head was dunked in water, <clears throat> and I was ba I was I was baptized a Catholic mm -hmm. through no choice of my own. I had nothing to say about that, and and uh, ended up at the nuns when I was in the first grade with no choice of my own, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and, and and a lot of people like that, and and I've we've chatted about this, even in the Catholic Church. There's a whole generation of people that got lost who, because of some of the teachings of the church, they didn't want to deal with, they couldn't handle it. And the church was not willing to budge, and they were not willing to budge, and they're gone. And, 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 and we see that in situations where there's merging of parishes because they can't support them. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you take Southbridge. One time they had four big Catholic churches. And, 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 and now it's down to one parish, but there's still two churches left that they physically use. And, uh, and so you see that, you know. And I, I said earlier, when I was a kid growing up, uh, and I grew up in Malden, and the church was in the middle of the Malden Square of the Sacred Hearts Parish, there was a Monsignor and five priests. And uh, there was 11 masses on a Sunday, starting at 6 wow. in the morning, up and oh downstairs. Gosh. Six in the morning, and they went back six, six thirty, seven, seven, back and forth, and there was a, there was standing room only. You know, you I I went there two years ago. I'm in the Hall of Fame, and there's a banquet every November for the new new kids coming into the high school Hall of Fame. So I go every year. We, we sit at the old stars table now, but but we go every year. And the, uh, one year I said to my mom and dad are buried there, and I said, you know, Jen. I said, let's just go out. We'll get a room and we'll start, rather than come back and forth, we'll stay over. Well, we did. And just out of Sunday morning, I said, you know what? Let's go to the 9 o'clock Mass. I haven't been to Sacred Heart since I left Malden 40, 50 years ago. Let's go. Well, we went to the 9 o'clock Mass. Now, I remember the 9 o'clock Mass. You couldn't get in. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's one of those big old Catholic churches, you know, with the big high ceilings. Sure. And it holds 1,100 people. Okay. At the 9 o'clock Mass, there's now a pastor and one priest. And if they had 70 people at the 9 o'clock Mass, mm -hmm. that was a lot. Yeah. I was stunned. Yeah. And after Mass, I, I met the pastor and I introduced myself and chatted with him. And uh, we got chatting and he says, oh, he says, Dick, I've looked up the records and I cry. Mm, I bet. You know, he, said, he says, I look back at the Grand Annual Collection back in the 60s and 70s. They used to raise $135,000, $140,000. You know, and he says, we don't do that in a year. Yeah. You know. And I think part of it is part of a, a growing movement in our culture. And certainly in New England, New England is, is about the, as unchurched as any other area. Oh, yeah. You see the rankings and yeah. all New England states are in the top ten of being unchurched. And there's you know, a broader trend uh, where they will do surveys and ask people their religious affiliation, Catholic, Protestant, yeah. Jew, Islam. One of the categories are nuns, N-O-N-E-S, N-U-N-S, N-O-N, you know, nuns. In other words, I have no, and, and that is the fastest growing category in our country, are those yeah. who would identify themselves as nuns, yeah. which I think is a reflection of our culture and maybe dwindling in many places, yeah. church attendance. And I think also provides one of the most challenging mission fields for churches is to understand why are they nuns um, and, and in what way can we um, communicate the gospel not change the message because that's timeless. Yeah. But how do we communicate to this group of people who have no affiliation? Many of them, perhaps, because they are not just indifferent to the church; uh, they are hostile to the church. Yeah. And and that's a very challenging audience. And um, you know, fortunately, I believe ultimately it is the Holy Spirit who moves people's hearts and minds to right. embrace the gospel. But still, it's upon the church. You know, what is our part to play? And to reach this uh, challenging group, because uh, all indications are that that percentage will continue to rise. Oh yeah. And well, what I, that means for the church. I was talking to someone recently, a good friend of mine, and he, he has four kids, three boys and a girl, and all three boys were altar service kids growing up, and he said now they're married and they have kids of their own. He says they were all married in the church. He says, however, out of the four of them, there's only one. <laughs> who's a faithful Catholic. Mm -hmm. The others are faithful to nobody. Yeah. They don't even go to church. Mm -hmm. And he says, I can't even get them to go Christmas. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, I, rem <laughs> I remember Father McIsaac at, 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 at Christmas used to stand up and say, 
I want to welcome all you once a year Catholics, you know. But, <laughs> but, but having said that, it, it's, it's a growing situation. And you mentioned the nuns, mm -hmm. um, and they're there, mm -hmm. and they're yeah. real. And a lot of them were brought up, you know, really, I, I, I had a great friend of mine growing up, uh, the, the Roselli's from Everett. And uh, Mary Ann and I, I, I thought she was great, and we went, dated a couple of times. And I hadn't seen her for 60 years. And there was, there was the five Roselli kids. And they used to go to the Mystic Side Congregational Church. And of course, I went Sacred Heart. And, and we were great buddies. And we palled around together. And, uh, and I was talking to me. I found her in Connecticut, went down, and we had lunch. I hadn't seen her for f over 40 years. So we had a great visit. And I asked her about you know, her brother Tommy and George and the rest of the kids. And they were very, very, very religious. I mean, their mother, every Sunday. They'd go to the church. They'd go to church, and they never missed a Sunday. And and Mary Ann said, once they got married, mm. she said that was that. She yeah. says, and uh, my own two kids, they they don't go to church, yeah. you know. And I and I, I said, wow, you know, because it, it was a different world back then. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't care what religion you were, you went, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember all the kids that were Jews. They used to go to Hebrew school, you know, and they went. You know, you didn't have a choice, and uh, and I, I'm not so sure that a lot of that was because of that. Yeah. You know, and then remember, w the nuns, the N U N S <laughs> okay. that we had, <clears throat> they put the fear of God in you. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people grew up fearing God. Mm -hmm. This wonderful guy, who now we say has great mercy and and loves us all, yet some of us were brought up. Mm. You know, if you didn't go to church, if you didn't bless yourself, you didn't, God was going to get you. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and so that might have had. I don't. I don't know the real yeah. effect. Yeah, there, there's so many different variables that uh, that come into play uh, that they have that has brought us to that point, and we'll yeah. continue to to do so. And a lot of it is is broader cultural uh, factors that are are happening. And um, though in other places, I know my wife will go down the south occasionally, and of course there you have. Churches, particularly Baptist churches, on every corner. Oh yeah, the, and you have much higher church attendance. Yeah. But within that, there is you know the Bible Belt. Yeah. Uh, how much of that faith? And I can't judge people's no, hearts, no. gods. But in terms of a general, sense, how many of there are there simply because it's their culture? Uh, there is a culture that is um, that is um, supportive of religion, and so yeah. you go, and so they're there because it's a cultural thing, not because of a heart. Commitment uh, to the yeah. King of the Lord of Lords. So yeah. there is a there's another type and, and of mission a, and challenge. And, and, and there's also the, the, the social aspect of it. If mm -hmm. you don't go to church, yeah. you know, especially in an area out. like that mm -hmm. where where everybody is so committed, mm -hmm. if you don't go, you almost go because you have to go. Yeah, and so because if your neighbor sees you didn't go to church this week, you yeah. know. So in, in some ways, I like being in New England. Yes, you know, so they call it God's frozen people and, yeah. and all that stuff. And certainly, again, all the statistics say we're the most unchurched area in the country. Maybe yeah. California fits in there as well. Yeah. Um, but I enjoy doing it. I enjoy the culture. I enjoy, I enjoy the climate. Um, yeah. I'm a Minnesota boy. Yeah, uh, well, you know the so weather. Th so there's a certain amount of, of, of overlap between right. them. But I love New England. And even some of the challenges uh, that New England presents um, I really, I really find it invigorating, and again, I believe uh, that even all the cultural components that might be resistant to the gospel, I come back to Jesus' comments to his disciples: uh, "You'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, yeah. and through Him you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, yeah. and the ends of the earth." And if we think our culture is tricky, first-century Roman culture was not a cakewalk. No, no. Uh, and, and the church flourished. And so I, I do believe in spite of the cultural challenges that New England presents, it's a great place to be. And I, I love ministering yeah. here. Well, no, and, and, and I think that's, I mean, I, I was talking to, to Kirsten and I, we, we, did a, we did a separate program with her. And she grew up in, in that area and, uh, yes. and came here. And, uh, and has been here five years and she's, basically similar to you, mm -hmm. said she just loves it here. Yeah. You know, she said she really, really, really enjoys it. And she said people are so different, and yet the people who go to her church are incredibly supportive and faithful, <clears throat> you know. And mm -hmm. she says, and that's my reward, yeah. you know, is, is that, uh, that, that they, they show up and they're helpful and they, and they do things and they're committed. And, uh, and I think that's, 
the other thing about New England, once you get somebody, you got them. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know, that's true. And, uh, and, and they're very, but you know, it's a challenge for, for all the religions in, in, in that discussion. How do you get them back? You know, uh, I remember having a conversation with a good friend of mine who was a priest, and I said, Father, look, you're going to have to be willing to ease up a little bit. You know, if you think you're going to get these people back, mm -hmm. and you, you know, know, that's I mean, every generation you have to ask that sort of question. And somebody said there are, there are no grandchildren in the kingdom. Yeah, uh, nobody gets in on their parents' coattails. Yeah, and generations change. Of course, now the generations. You know, they just talk generations is 15, 20 years between yeah. them. Now generations are five or six apiece. And yeah. so I think you have to look at each new generation. I think you have to retain the integrity of the core gospel message. Oh, yeah. But in terms of how you articulate that, how you present it, you are aware of the cultural variables. Yeah. You even think of, for example, like when the Holy Spirit first came at Pentecost, you look at Peter's sermon in Jerusalem. It is full of Old Testament scripture yeah. all the way through. You go to Acts 17, Paul is preaching in Athens. He doesn't quote scripture once. The only quote he gives is a Greek Stoic philosopher. Yeah. Same gospel, but recognizing two very different audiences, yeah. primarily Jewish audience in Jerusalem, for whom there'd be a connection with those Old Testament texts, to Paul preaching to the, to the Roman and, and, yeah. and, and Greek philosophers. And so there is, I think there's kind of a, a picture there where you retain the core gospel message. You know, Paul says, by grace you've been saved through faith. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the core, and that can never be compromised yeah. or watered down. But, but how you articulate that to each new generation in their language, yeah. in the context of the questions they are asking, uh, that's, the real, that's the real challenge. And each, each generation yeah. of, of churches, church leaders, church yeah. people have to wrestle with that, oh, as, I, as, as we do. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I always tell the story. We lived in Sturbridge. We used to go to a church over there. We moved to Charlton, and we still went back to the other church. And one Sunday, I was going through the Globe, and I looked up, it was 10 minutes to 10. I said, Jen, we'll never make Sturbridge. <laughs> I saw a sign up by the bank, St. Joseph's Church. It can be a little church up there. I had never seen it. <laughs> Drove up the street, driving down this little road with turn. trees. I'm saying, what am I, where am I going? Like a little wayside chapel. You're then I, yeah, then I pull in, and I looked like <laughs> I was in Newport, Rhode Island with the, anyway, that was one of Father Bob's homilies. All are welcome in my church mm -hmm. with his arms open. All are welcome in my, I don't care what you are, you're welcome here. Mm -hmm. You know, I walked out, in fact, it was funny, we were leaving, and he calls us over, aren't you too new? <laughs> you know, yeah. but that's Father Bob. But anyway, mm -hmm. I walked out, I said, wow, I really went to church today. I mean, I had, you know, you just don't hear that. You know, all are welcome, you know, I don't care what you are, you know, come. And, uh, and so it was, it was unique. And as it happens, it's really his, that church is really growing, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And, uh, and, and I just, we were out to dinner last night and a woman said, oh, I saw you people at church. I went there for the first time. I had never been before. I went on yes, and on about yeah. how much she enjoyed that. Wow, you have a beautiful choir and you sing and everybody's friendly and mm -hmm. everybody's reaching out. And it, it's what it is. And, 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 uh, and so I think that the, the amazing thing is that it can happen. I mean, mm -hmm. there can be growth, uh, but but how do you? What's the solution? Is that's the real thing? How do you how do you win them over? Yeah, and that's the question. Nuns? We as church leaders, uh, because there's so much we can do in terms of our strategy and programming yeah. and all that. But again, we have to realize, you know, basically we don't change people's hearts. No. What we can do is present the truth in a way that can be understood in a way that can be embraceable, but it really is the work of the Spirit oh, uh, yeah. to bring about that heart change. So we, can, yeah. we can wag our finger at people yeah. and say, do this and don't do that. And yeah. you might get a certain amount of outward conformity. You're creating Pharisees. You know, Jesus yeah, says, yeah. you wash the outside of your cup and yeah. the inside is dirty. Dirty, yeah. <laughs> so, so I think you know, ultimately, as we talk about as leaders, you know, we cannot uh, diminish the role of the Holy Spirit, you know, no. work that He wants to do in changing hearts and, and in lives that they might more right. fully uh, embrace God's grace in, in, in Christ and then grow in God's grace. Yeah.
Well, there's where we are. Yes. Well, we've run out of time. Okay. Reverend Steve, it's been a terrific program. I love this. Folks, we chatted with, with Reverend Steve Nordby of the uh, Charlton Baptist Church, and we'll have to do this again because we'll I think two. it's... Uh, yeah, we will, because <laughs> I think it's important um, that, we, that we have that message out there, mm -hmm. um, that uh, all are welcome in our churches. Exactly. That's simple. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. It's my great thing. And there you have it, folks. That's another Conversations With.